Welcome to the Birth Journeys Podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Hoff, BSN RN. I am a wife, a mother of two, and a nurse specializing in the care of women and newborns. In this podcast, we will share powerful journeys of birth givers with the goals of lifting the veil on the birth experience, healing through sharing, and beginning an open conversation to strengthen trust and promote transparency between birthing people and healthcare providers. Hello, today I have with me Susie Veers. Susie is a doula and a mother of two. She is here today to share with us about the importance of birth prep, becoming confident about birth, and finding your voice and learning to advocate for yourself in the delivery room. Susie also has insight on how to find insurance coverage for doula care after recent legislation has been passed to allow birth support. Susie, welcome and thank you for joining me. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to hear about all your insight because birth prep was one of my passions. I would love to hear about your take on birth prep and how you came to be a birth doula and how we can all have doulas at the bedside. Well, I came here in not a straight or linear fashion at all. I started my career, I studied economics, I worked in finance. My experiences becoming a mother was not necessarily an easy route. I experienced loss at 14 weeks with my first pregnancy, a year's worth of medical complications due to that. And then my pregnancy with my first daughter, but second pregnancy Mm -hmm. was like so easy, so great in comparison to what I had been through. But her birth was wild and not what I expected at all. And I realized that there had been so many things that I wish I had known before. And after her birth, I was like, okay, like I just wanted to close the chapter on birth, pregnancy. It was not for me, but I knew I wanted to have another child. And luckily I met a friend who was a student midwife. And as we would spend time together and I'd hear the stories from her clients, I started to think I missed out on so much. Like there was so much joy and closeness and bonding and love and excitement in all of this. I always say it like the way I went through pregnancy and birth with my first child is if you're on a hike in a beautiful area and all you do is you stare down at your feet and think, what if I fall off the cliff? What if I fall off the cliff? What if I fall off the cliff? And then you fall off the cliff, right? And so when I had Hazel, I had somebody to kind of guide me, help me understand like a a broader perspective, a more holistic perspective, help me understand what my needs were, help me know how I could actually meet those needs. And I had an incredible experience with Hazel's birth. And I had both a midwife and a doula that I was very close to, and they took very good care of this younger version of myself who was coming into the experience with quite a lot of trauma to process. And it was just such an empowering experience. So after Hazel was born, when she was a year, I went and did my certification as a doula. And I've been a doula for about five years. I've been a childbirth educator for about three of those. And I just really, really love helping moms gain that knowledge, gain that confidence, gain that trust in themselves and in their team before birth instead of after. (laughs) We can heal from the difficult experiences and sometimes birth throws curveballs that we can't plan for. I don't want to paint too rosy of a picture in the sense that if you prepare, it will always be perfect. It won't. But if you know that you're capable of meeting the challenges as they come, there's a lot less fear and a lot more joy in the process. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's so much flexibility and mental preparedness that is needed to be able to feel successful and powerful and joyful during the birth experience. Because it is a challenge. It is a very physical experience. It's very intense. It's like, for lack of a better metaphor, it is like running a marathon. And Mm -hmm. it's something that you do need to prepare for. So especially if you've never done it before, if you have no idea what you're in for, you need to figure out how you're going to rise to the challenge, no matter what comes. And it's such a good preparation for parenthood, I think, because you're going to continue to have those opportunities to rise to the occasion throughout your parenthood journey. And birth is just the gateway to that whole parenting experience. I like how you 
word, your mission. I like that you put the power onto the birthing person versus when I go to a doula website or when I talk to doulas, they talk about being the advocate versus helping the mom become their own advocate. And I think that is such a fine line, but it's a very important distinction because when you're advocating for someone and they don't have a voice themselves, then are you really advocating for them? And that's something that I've wrestled with for a long time. But I wonder if you could speak to the distinction between helping someone finding their voice and learning to advocate for themselves and when to step in and advocate for them and how to make that distinction. Yeah, I think for me, a lot of that comes down to, I always have the goal of protecting a mom's right to informed consent. The longer I've been a doula, the more that I try to make sure that that's covered before you go into labor. Because once you're in labor, you should have the freedom to be able to go into labor land and to kind of disconnect from the way that we think and process and so that you can be present with your contractions, so that you can be present with your breath, so that you can be present with the moment. But there are decisions that have to be made sometimes during labor. I know I was just working with a mom. I was talking to her this morning. And here in Seattle, where I live, we fortunately have many, many different hospitals around us. So when I go to the hospital as a doula, there's like seven or eight different hospitals that I go to pretty regularly. This mom is at a hospital where the C-section rate for first-time low-risk moms is close to 40%. I know it's a very high number. I always try to get people to drive the extra 20 minutes because there's a hospital where that number is like 20%. But the care that is common there is very much like, your labor is not going to work. Let me help you. Mm. Let me fix it, right? And so it's like, let's intervene early. Let's intervene before there's a problem. Let's induce everybody. Let's use as much Pitocin as we can. And if there's fetal distress, well, it's just labor is so unpredictable. Good thing you were here. And it's this weird cycle. Medical help is so important in some cases, but some of the drugs commonly used in labor, Mm -hmm. um, like mesoprostol also goes by Cytotec. It's not even FDA approved to use in labor. It's Mm -hmm. FDA approved to use in stomach ulcers. And it says on the label, not approved for labor. No mm-hmm. safety data has ever been given on this. Mm-hmm. And Pitocin is on this high-risk list of only six drugs for drugs that can cause harm to a mother and baby, even when used correctly. And so with my clients, I try to help them think through like, okay, what does an ideal birth look like to you if everything goes perfectly? Like you don't have any medical complications. You're just sailing through this experience What does that look like? And we create that vision. But then we also have conversations about like, okay, if something goes wrong, when would you be open to these? And let's get you a little bit of knowledge about what does it look like when you might need help and what are those situations so you can have a logical choice, Mm -hmm. but you don't have to necessarily be thinking about everything all the way through your labor because you can let go and just be focused on that really really perfect plan, which very often does go that way when when you've planned and you're ready for the contractions. And, but also then when someone is equipped with a little bit of knowledge, then they can truly make their own decisions, mm-hmm. right? And so I try not to ever make decisions where people only provide information and context. And then when a person has made their decision, I let them state their decision. And then if they're getting pushed back, I'll typically come in and support their voice. For example, sometimes when water breaks, moms are like, I'm open to doing an induction, but I want to wait 12 or 24 hours before I start medication, Mm -hmm. knowing that most women will start labor on their own by then. And depending on how that conversation goes, depending on the hospital we're at, sometimes it's like, great. We'll see you in 12 hours. We'll see you in 24 hours. And other hospitals, it's like, no, we see you right away. That's what we do here. There is no choice unless you ask more questions. My strategy is to provide the information. And then once somebody's made their choice and vocalized their choice, if they're getting pushed back, which they typically don't, but if they do, just being the one to step in and say, this is what she said. 
Do you have concerns about that? What are your concerns? Okay, this is what she has said about that. This is what she's already vocalized to you. I like the way you word that because I always try to encourage my clients to use the words concerned or what are your concerns. I feel like that is such a disarming way to ask questions. And I also feel like the best way to get to the bottom of what people's thought processes are is to continue to ask questions. Like, what are your concerns? Can you help me understand what your thought process is or what your plan of action is or what your goals are with this? And then if we don't get to the point where we can come to a common understanding, then we can start saying things like, well, am I safe right now? Is my baby safe right now? Do we have time to think about the decision? Or how long can we go without doing anything right now? Because I agree, I feel like hospitals are getting better in general as more evidence comes about. I feel like we are starting to kind of relax and understand that not all birth is pathological. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And that's something that midwives and doulas have known for a long time because midwives and doulas specialize in low risk physiologically straightforward birth. I don't want to say normal because what is normal? Right. Really? But And there's such a wide variation mm-hmm. of what a labor can look like and still right. result in a healthy mom, healthy baby. And I just, I really think that we are coming from two different sides of the spectrum because me as a, I come from the labor mm-hmm. nurse medical side, but as a nurse, I've been a part of enough physiologically straightforward deliveries or inductions even that become Mm -hmm. straightforward because I know how to help someone move through labor. And I think it's important to be able to recognize normal in all of its stages Mm -hmm. and then be able to move towards, okay, I'm starting to see some things that may not be normal. Let's let's evaluate our options instead of coming from this place of all birth is medical. And then going back and trying to look for the arguments that this birth needs help. And so right. it's so important for moms to be able to, to make decisions that meet their needs as their needs evolve and change. Nobody asks to have really high blood pressure and nobody asks for their water to break at 35 weeks or 34 weeks. Like sometimes life throws us into these situations where we do need the medical help and We need to know how to ask for it and say like, hey, this is what happened to me. I think my water broke, but it seems too early. Do I still call? I once had a mom that had that happen and she didn't know. She was too scared. She was like, I didn't want to seem like I didn't know what was going on. So I didn't call my doctor. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. I love you and I'm your doula, but like, let's call together. And if that means your birth plan changes, then I'll still be by your side and you can have a beautiful birth. It just might take a different shape than you anticipated. Who else wants thicker, fuller-looking hair in just 60 days? Yes, please. Hey, moms and moms-to-be. These products have truly made a world of difference in my life, and they could do the same for you. At first, it seemed too good to be true, but Monate's products are clean, vegan, anti-aging hair care, that follows the world's strictest guidelines for safety. Did you know that the European Union has banned or restricted more than 1,300 chemicals, while the U.S. has only banned 11? I'm passionate about finding effective products that help mamas feel safe, and these products fit the bill perfectly. If you're navigating those postpartum hair changes or just want to improve your scalp health, I have the perfect solution for you. Monate's IR Clinical line has been a game changer for me. Let me tell you, the results are incredible. The Viral Hair Serum has significantly improved my hair density and thickness. Even Oprah Daily recommends it. When used with the patent-pending Breakthrough Hair Care System targeting hair thinning, this dermatologist-created and clinically tested system works wonders. Here's what you can expect. It reduces hair fall by up to 92%. It boosts scalp health. It contains essential ingredients to support natural hair growth. And it shows noticeable results of thicker, fuller-looking hair in as little as 60 days. Imagine what your hair could look like in 60 days. 
thicker, fuller, and healthier than ever before. If you're struggling with postpartum hair changes or just want to give your scalp the best care possible, Monate's IR Clinical line is your answer. Don't wait any longer to start your hair transformation. Message me today at birthjourneysrn at gmail.com to get started. I just know you'll love it. Let's start your hair transformation journey together. The results mentioned are based on a hair breakage study utilizing combing and brushing. The data for the IR Clinical Hair Thinning Defense Scalp Serum is derived from a study involving 39 women ages 18 to 70, which was supervised and evaluated by a dermatologist. Results regarding hair fiber diameter were determined through instrumental testing following the application of the IR Clinical Hair Thinning Defense Scalp Serum. Yeah, and you can still have autonomy during birth that wasn't exactly the way that you planned. Mm -hmm. Just like if the road is closed on your way to work, you can still get to work by going another route. It may be a longer route. It may not be your favorite view, but you'll still get there. And I think probably the most unhealthy thing that I see is this attempt to avoid dealing with the fear in the hopes that it makes it go away. It's I think we kind of go into fight or flight in our mind and our mind tells us that if we don't think about it or if we mentally run away from it, then we're safe from it. And I disagree. I think it's important to mentally confront the possibility and the options and ask yourself at what point, like you said, when would that be something that I would accept in my labor? When would Mm -hmm. that tool become important for me? And then go from there and figure out how to cope with needing that tool. Yeah. I I worked with a mom once who had done exactly what you said in her first birth, where she had really high blood pressure and she ignored it. Her doctor had said, I really want you to come in. Like you need to have your baby. This is unsafe now. And she was like, no, birth is so natural. And she ended up in this crazy emergent situation. When she reached out to me for her second birth, she was like, I've always wanted a natural labor, but I have to make the choice for an induction. I know like that's my biggest regret was that I didn't make that choice the first time, but I don't know how to protect my sovereignty in this situation. And so it wasn't that like having a doula or having somebody by her side meant that like we were avoiding things. A lot of it was supporting her in like, I'm very afraid. And she did a very brave thing, which was to recognize the same thing I recognized in my first birth was I didn't have the knowledge to ask the questions. I knew I had questions. I didn't know what they were. I knew I had big emotions, but I couldn't verbalize what those were yet. I think my midwife friend was the one that helped me kind of develop the vocabulary around that. And I truly didn't have the communication skills. Same with her to say like, you're telling me this, but I believe this, there's a gap. Where's the bridge? I truly don't have judgment on this for medical staff because I look at how busy they are. And like I was one time with a mom, it was like pushing her baby and the doctor as she was sitting there waiting to catch the baby, prescribed medication to a mom in another room, remembering her allergies advocated for a mom that came in through the emergency room that they were trying to send home. And she was like, no, if my patient came here, I am going to see her. Sometimes there's just a lot going on. If a provider is not giving you the information that you need, it's not because they don't care. They just might not know you well enough to know that you're not speaking up or you're still kind of sitting in the anxiety and you haven't found the words for it yet. So as a doula, it's often like building that bridge and that communication and asking the provider, can you stay a few more minutes? We have more questions. We need more information. We need to get to a place of feeling more security and safety before we can go forward with your recommendation, which is ultimately in this situation what needs to happen. Mm, I agree. It's an unfortunate downside if you are wanting a hospital birth or if you're required to have a hospital birth because of any kind of illness or complication to the pregnancy. That is the downside that you're going to be sharing your doctor or even if it's a midwife, our midwives, one of the hospitals I work at are the busiest ones on the floor because they have all the patients. It's a huge practice and you get one (laughs) midwife and they they can be delivering 10 
babies <laughs> on the floor oh <laughs> at one time. Like they'll just be bouncing wow. from room to room to room. And unfortunately, the downside of being in the hospital is you have the potential to become someone described at one time as like a cog in the machine. And if you are requiring more attention, it may slow down the whole machine. And then we have to prioritize that attention. So if you are physiologically normal and safe and someone else isn't, and our need to put more attention on you means that we can't put attention to this other emergency that's going on, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to put that attention onto you. We're going to have to prioritize, which is sad, but it is the truth. And it is very frustrating for a patient that is wanting the care that all patients deserve. They deserve, right? Yeah. And it's not the people in the system's fault Mm -hmm. because if you're with midwife with 10 patients, you can only do so much Mm -hmm. and your heart can be with every single person and yet your time and attention can only be in one place. Something that I encounter and I'm starting to notice a shift or maybe I'm just trying to find the birth workers who have already made this shift. I notice more doulas that are becoming more comfortable with the realities of hospital birth. And I'm seeing less of what I used to see and what I guess gave the conflict we all know can exist between hospital and doula was this everybody in their own corner situation, right? So the medical aspect of birth and the natural aspect of birth and everybody is just trying to fight their own logic. But now what I'm seeing is a lot more ability for the doula to support someone through a birth, given the resources that are in the hospital or given the obstacles that are in the hospital, right? So if you were having a home birth, for instance, you are less likely to be monitored continuously. In fact, you probably can't be monitored continuously, right? Right. I mean, a midwife can sit there and like listen with the Doppler. And I have seen that at home births where it's like, I need to pay extra attention, but it's not going to be like the continuous or like, I wasn't sure what I heard. I need to listen in the like two contractions in a row, but it's still not like wearing the monitors. You know, you go for a walk and they fall on your foot. Yes. And so then you stop walking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there's a give and take. And it would be lovely if the midwives could do the monitoring for one or two contractions on everyone. But once you start, like you said, the side attack, we have to monitor because we don't know how the baby's going to react. The Pitocin, we have to monitor because we don't know how the babies react. We're moving away in at least the hospitals that I'm working at and the guidelines from ACOG and A1 and all of the governing bodies are now saying that we can do the the pre-induction with intermittent monitoring because it's safe and because moms have pushed back because they don't want to be unnecessarily monitored. But how do we work with when we're in a hospital having a natural, physiologically straightforward Mm -hmm. birth, and still having to have the IV port not necessarily hooked up, or having the intermittent monitoring and all of that stuff. I feel like it takes a special skill set from a doula to be able to support a mom through a hospital birth versus through a home birth. If there were new people starting out that wanted to be doulas, what would you tell them about how to support somebody through that? Yeah. I don't know if my answers are perfect, but I can share what I do. Most of my births are in the hospital. I had a home birth. I loved my home birth. I occasionally go to home births, super special experiences when they go well, super easy comparatively to being in the hospital. Like sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm just a photographer. It's a completely different feeling. But for me, for all my clients, home birth, hospital births, What I do is before labor, we meet twice. And the first time we're very focused on the birth plan and we go through a checklist of every single thing that's going to happen or every choice that they have. So we will talk through, okay, when you're dilating, when you're pushing in in the golden hour. And that's our chance to talk about like, okay, when we get to the hospital, this is what's going to happen in triage. You're going to get an IV you're going to typically get a cervical check. You're going to be monitored continuously at least for the first 15 minutes to a half hour. That is part of triage. And now let's talk about what your needs are, knowing that this is what it is. 
sometimes I've worked with a few moms that have been victims of sexual assault who are like, I am very worried about that cervical check. I cannot do it. And so it's at that point before they're in labor where we're saying, okay, a cervical check is part of triage. Now we need to come up with a plan. And I have on occasion asked people, have you talked to your doctor about your abuse? Do they know that this is more triggering to you than someone else? And their doctors have noted, we will not do a cervical check in their official medical documentation. So when we get to triage and we say we were hoping to delay the cervical check, and often there's an agreement here if all is going well, either until after an epidural or until starting to feel an urge to push or somewhere later in labor where a lot of times clients can kind of have some choice about when it would be okay for them. And then having that choice, it makes it so that intervention isn't as difficult or after an epidural, it won't feel the same. It won't bring them the same trauma. And same with the IV port. We talk about how do you do with needles? What are the things that go through your minds? What do you do when you're in stressful situations? How can I help you through this? Is it going to be distracting you? Do you need to know everything that's going on? A lot of hospitals have like special IV teams that can come in with a little ultrasound machine and that can get it right on the first time. Is there something that we can do to make this easier for you? And so sometimes the conversation isn't necessarily, you know, a lot of home births moms are opting out of a lot of things and that's fine. I want to opt out as much as I can, but I can't opt out of everything either because of the location they're at or because the the life situation that their pregnancy and birth is happening within. And in those cases, when we talk about it before and we've gone through literally everything from start to finish, then it's like this weight off of their shoulders. And then they can get practice talking with their doctor about it. Sometimes I will go with them in very special cases and have that conversation with them and say like, we're trying to meet you halfway. These are her needs. How can you help us? And sometimes it will be the doctor that will say, you know what, I see that you're trying and this is how I can help you. And we'll come up with kind of a new alternative that's more helpful to the specific person, but maybe not the same as like we do a, a cervical check for everybody. And I don't think it would be possible for a hospital system to write a rule that would truly take into account everybody's needs. So from my perspective, it's really trying to help people get that individualized care within the parameters of what does good care look like? Because we never, ever, ever want to sacrifice getting attention when it's needed due to any philosophies that may or may not be applicable in a specific moment of time. I think that's a really good point that it isn't possible, that all the rules that hospitals come up with are essentially to keep people safe, maintain lower liability, right? We need to have standardized care so that we know that we've got evidence behind what we're doing, but also hospitals are attempting to have patient-centered care. So how do those two things come together? That's a difficult job, especially if you're working in the hospital and taking care of multiple patients. And so we need people that understand how to help with patient-centered care that also understand how hospitals work and how to work within the confines of what hospitals can offer. Because we can't necessarily offer a home birth environment, or even some can't offer the birth center environment, just given the infrastructure. There are more and more hospitals that are getting on board with that. But how often are old hospitals upgrading to new buildings? Probably not more than every 20, 30 years. So we're going to be a little behind the times. There's so much that you have to consider Cost-wise, you know, there's not as much real estate in some areas. And so then you have space that you have limitations. And so when you go to a hospital where there's going to be multiple people birthing on one floor, there's going to be limits to what they can offer. We would want to offer a birth pool to everyone. We want to offer an environment that looks like your home to everyone. We would love to offer one nurse, one midwife, one doctor, one doula to each patient. That requires a lot of money that isn't necessarily available and insurance companies aren't necessarily going to pay for. And we have to also offer certain levels of technology in order to keep the high risk patients safe. It's a totally different animal than someone that's giving birth at home because they are 
physiologically healthy and their pregnancy is 100% low risk. And so far, we have not seen any kind of indication that we're going anywhere towards medium to high risk. It's completely different. And I think it's so important to have an understanding of what that means and how to help have the birth that someone wants given those confines. And as nurses, to make that happen, we are trained about like the medical and the physiological aspects of birth. And then what to mm-hmm. do when things are medicalized, we are taught how to handle a postpartum hemorrhage. We're taught how to help resuscitate a baby. We're taught the emergency situations, and that is what is emphasized. And that is so critically important. It is. And so then to be able to support the people that are there for the emergencies, because we need all hands on deck, to have that support person that that knows how to work around all of the hospital equipment without necessarily messing it up or knows that their job isn't to interfere with the hospital equipment but work around it. That's super Mm -hmm. important. And I love that there are programs out there to help dads or partners. Mm -hmm. And also, they are not an expert in supporting somebody through low-risk birth, right? And to have somebody that is trained in supporting someone in low-risk birth at the bedside is amazing. And I wish that hospitals would employ more doulas so that we could have somebody at the bedside all the time. And so that there is no conflict when we do have somebody coming in from the outside that may not know how our hospital system works. And so right. you would have to like go research each hospital. And I think it's so important. You have a perspective that I haven't had a chance to look into, and that is how to get a doula through insurance. I think one of the biggest barriers to getting doula care is that birth can be so expensive for people, even if you have adequate insurance coverage. There's a lot of money that goes into birth. So to have that extra cost of a doula is sometimes a little bit of a a challenge for some couples, especially when you're considering how much money you're going to be putting forth for a baby, all of that stuff. So now that there is the option, at least the Medicaid option, are all insurance companies now getting on board with doula care? Yeah. So that's a fabulous question. And I completely agree with you because when I think back to my own pregnancies and births, there is no way. I remember, I remember very clearly one day when I was sitting at my office, I worked at an investment bank at the time. Later, I became a stay at home mom and the gap between my kids. And so we were much more financially strapped before my second one. But like, I remember having a conversation with with me And there were two other people on my team and their wives were pregnant. And my friend Travis was like, we just got a doula. We're taking these classes. And they were kind of like super into all the natural things. And when I heard how much it cost, I like almost died. And I was like, there is no way I would ever pay that for any of this. So I do find it a little bit ironic that like that was my first thought when it came to doulas. And my first exposure was like, Why would anyone pay for something that expensive? Not every insurance company covers doulas. Hopefully that will change. I hope it becomes much more accessible. And not every state covers it in their Medicaid programs. It is something that's been ongoing where more and more states, there's a handful of states that are currently reimbursing doula care coverage. There is a handful of states like mine where it has been approved by the legislature to cover doula coverages, but the programs are being built out. And then there are states where it's being considered and there's states where it's not even being talked about at all. So it really does depend on where you live. There's also a lot of employers that are offering reimbursement programs for doulas. I know in my area, like Boeing just added a program through their HR, Microsoft, there's a handful of companies here. So if you're unsure about can you get help paying for a doula, call your HR if you work for a larger company and find out. Um, Some people are surprised when they found out like, oh, my company does pay for a doula. I just have to submit a form and then I get reimbursed. Should we go over like the states that are actively? Do you want to know? 
Yeah, I think that would be helpful because I think a lot of people just don't know. And I think that a lot of people would look for those options if they knew they were available. Hey there, incredible mamas and mamas-to-be. Are you looking for an online community where the magic of motherhood meets the empowerment of self-care? Then I've got just the place for you. Join my Bump and Beyond online community. At Bump and Beyond, we celebrate the journey of every bump rocker and post-birth boss. You, dear mama, deserve nothing but the best, and that's exactly what this community provides. Prepare to be pampered, cherished, and showered with all the love and support you deserve. Our mission is simple yet powerful, to be your one-stop destination for all things self-care, nurturing, and indulgence. Because let's face it, you're not just a mom, you're a fierce, unstoppable family CEO. At Bump and Beyond, I search the nation for mamas who are passionate about helping other mamas like you become the most successful version of yourself during your motherhood journey. Every resource in this community is either a virtual service that you can enjoy in the comfort of your own home or a product that can be shipped right to your doorstep. And everyone in the community is passionate about helping new mamas thrive. So come on in, explore our virtual aisles, connect with like-minded individuals, and immerse yourself in a community that is always here for you. Whether you're browsing, making new friends, or simply treating yourself, Know that this space is yours to return to whenever you need a dose of positivity and empowerment. Welcome to a place where you are celebrated, cherished, and honored every step of the way. Welcome to the Bump and Beyond online community, where every mom shines like the superstar she is. Join us today and let's build our motherhood village together. Go to www.facebook.com backslash groups backslash bump and beyond. That's www.facebook.com backslash groups backslash B-U-M-P, N as in Nancy, B-E-Y-O-N-D. You can also find the link in the show notes. Be sure to say that you heard about us on the Birth Journeys podcast. I can't wait to see you there. Right. I am really excited. I know in here in Washington, our program, our Medicaid covers about 40% of births. So that is 40% of women that will have doulas reimbursed once the program goes through all the way. Mm-hmm. All right. So we've got California mm-hmm. is already reimbursing and processing for doula coverage. The District of Columbia, Florida, Maryland, Michigan, Minnesota, New Jersey, Nevada, Oklahoma, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Virginia are the states that currently now, if you're looking for a doula and you live in one of those states and you're on Medicaid, you can get a doula covered through your Medicaid insurance. Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Louisiana, Massachusetts, New York, um, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Washington, we have all passed legislature to add it, but the programs aren't quite built out yet. So in the next couple of years, you should see that becoming an option. That's amazing. And then is it through the employer's insurance or is it like if, for instance, Boeing, is it Mm -hmm. just a matter you just contact HR or do you need to contact your employer insurance or does it depend? Do you know? I think it depends, but For most of the reimbursement programs where I've like filled out the paperwork, like as a doula, I typically have to provide my certification number, my training dates, the EIN of my business, things like that. For the paperwork that I fill out, people are mostly submitting to their HR. Mm -hmm. I would recommend check with your HR. And if they don't yet, maybe mention it to your company like, hey, other companies are doing this and maybe you should too. Yeah. That's really important. So from my end, as I'm a labor nurse and I provide birth prep, I will help people find a doula. I mostly work with people that are going to birth in the hospital because that's what I know. And so my goal when I'm trying to find a doula is to find somebody that is supportive of the hospital birth environment and understands how to work with that. Mm -hmm. How would someone go about finding a doula if they're going to have a hospital birth? especially if they're going to have a hospital birth that might have some complications. What would be some things that they would look for or key questions that they would ask 
to make sure that they're finding someone that's going to work well with the hospital staff and the hospital environment and the hospital equipment. Yes. I think that's really important because sometimes I do hear people say like, I won't go to the hospital and that Mm -hmm. always surprises me, that attitude, but it does exist and it's good to be aware that the person that you're hiring to support you is actually supporting your plan and not trying to give you a different vision, Yeah, right? Not trying to change your plan. I would say first you can start with a Google search for like doula in my area. There's a great website called Doula Match where you can put in your zip code and your due date. And it's more popular in some places than others, but I know here almost every doula is on there. I would start by like read their reviews. If a doula has experience and they're active in their community, people are going to be leaving reviews either on Google or Doula Match. And so you can kind of see what the experiences and the type of births that other parents have had with that specific doula. Then always, I always recommend interviewing more than one doula. I know I think I interviewed three or four before I was like, you're my person. And ask them, tell them, hopefully the first thing that they're asking you is about what is your birth plan and what are you worried about? What are the obstacles in your birth? What are you excited about? How do you approach challenges? And you should be able to have really good conversations that are based on empathy and logic. And you can see through their answers that the doula has followed through. I always think it's helpful to hear specific stories. One thing that I'll do for my clients is right now working with a mom that is a VBAC mom. And she unfortunately had a very poor experience with her first VBAC at the hospital. She has a lot of trauma from that. And so she was trying to figure out, I want to be back at the hospital. I don't want to have that same type of care. And so for her, I connected her to a couple moms that I had worked with, had VBACs in the hospitals that she was considering. So she could talk through somebody about what was the experience like, what was good about it, what was bad about it. And I think Tula's a really good about helping you get those closer experiences from others that have been in the same place as you. Yeah, I think that that's important because when you're asking those questions and you know what your goals are, if someone starts to push back on that, then you kind of know if they're not a good match, Mm -hmm. you feel good. If you're starting to feel stressed out and defensive when you're talking to somebody that you're hoping to support you through your birth, that's a sign that that's not going to be a good fit because you don't want to feel that way in your birth. Which leads me to my next question, which is a hospital environment is not necessarily the most comfortable and welcoming environment to deliver a baby. You and I both know that the stress response counteracts the labor response, right? So if we're stressed Mm -hmm. out by the hospital environment, we need to figure out how to move through that to be able to get to the point where we're like relaxing and in labor land, as you were saying. And that has to be low stress. So how do you protect that bubble of labor land when Mm -hmm. you're in the hospital environment? I think first prenatal where you go through the birth plan, I cannot stress enough how much of a difference that makes to have already thought through this is what it's going to be. If we're doing a natural birth, nothing seems wrong. They're appropriate. It's appropriate to do intermittent monitoring. Labor happens at night all the time then yes, bring some little light up candles that are battery operated. Turn on music that you love. Turn on a diffuser if it's okay with your nurse. Some people are very sensitive, so we want to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love about hypnobirthing is all the visualizations. If you've never heard of that, that Mm -hmm. method of birth prep is it's a lot of meditation and affirmations and a lot of visualization. And if you have put a little bit of effort and energy and thought into picturing a very joyful birth in a busy location. You can be in the busiest location ever and it can still feel slow and peaceful and open. And I think a lot of that energy is what we bring to it Mm -hmm. because you can be in a very busy hospital environment and still have it feel not that different from being at home in your bedroom. You have to have talked about your fears of the hospital if you carry those fears, maybe done a little fear release around that. Turning down the beeping on the monitors helps asking your nurse to help you with that, actually, because nobody should touch the monitors but the nurses. (laughs) But really, the energy that you bring is the energy that will be in the room. 
And so if you practiced and thought through and planned for how am I going to bring joy and what am I going to do in those moments of doubt and fear, it's very much like a carousel, right? It's normal to feel great and then have doubt and worry and not be sure if you can do it and then come back up to feeling like, oh, you know what? I can do this. This is good. I am in the right place. I do like it here. The very simple things and then the intention that you bring. Mm -hmm. I think I thought of one other thing that came up for me. How can nurses support a natural birth? Or maybe the best way to word it is how can nurses avoid interfering with a natural birth? because of all of the stuff that we have to check off our list. I think most of the things are pretty simple. I so appreciate nurses that know how to do intermittent monitoring. Learning that skill, I so, so appreciate it. I know you have a million intake questions that you have to get through, and it's not really an option. But if you can find those gaps in between contractions or let a mom get into the birth tub and ask her between contractions while she's already in the tub. I can run the tub while you're doing the initial checking the blood pressure and doing all that kind of stuff. And first, let's make sure the pain control is staying managed. And second, then the questions. And third, just know that one thing that I have moms tell me a lot for their second baby is if they're reaching out to me like, oh, I tried a natural birth and it didn't work. So now I want a doula for my second one to help is that a lot of people will say, my nurse only offered me an epidural and what I needed was encouragement. Mm. So I think like if someone has a natural birth plan, you can ask questions like, do you want me to offer you an epidural if as your labor is progressing? And if her answer is no, then just trust that she will ask for one if she needs it. And you can say things like, you are so strong. I've never seen anyone so beautiful during a contraction. Your connection with your breath is really powerful. Do you want to do it now or in three contractions? Sometimes just having a very short amount of time before having an IV placed or doing something like that that needs to get done helps the mom kind of get into the mental space of I'm leaving labor land, I'm coming to do what you need, and then I'm going back to labor land. Mm -hmm. I appreciate our nurses so much, though. You carry so much on your plate. And when I watch all the charting, my mind is always just in awe of the hundreds of things that you seem to be doing while I'm doing a simple hip squeeze. (laughs) (laughs) It's not fun trying to not bother someone and then... (laughs) get all that other stuff. No, it's, on, it's, but, yeah. Sometimes it's needed though. I mean, mm-hmm. it's how you keep not just one person safe, but everybody safe in the hundreds and thousands of different scenarios that can happen during birth. Yeah. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about that we didn't cover? I just want to say to moms, you are all so powerful. And I hope that as you go through the birth process, that it is really empowering to you. Like, somebody who graduates from college or finishes a marathon or accomplishes anything worthwhile. As you go through the process, you see your commitment, your growth, your change, and you're not defined by the low moments. You're defined by the the victory that is yours, no matter how you came through the experience, the joy that is yours. Yeah, that's so important. It is a transformation and no matter how it looks, you'll be a completely different person afterwards. When you prepare for that, it will be a beautiful transformation. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate all your insight. Thank you. I so appreciate it. It's nice to be able to talk from the different perspectives of nurse and doulas. I feel like we should always be like BFFs. So we totally should. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's start a nurse doula BFF club. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> How would anybody contact you if they wanted to hire you as a doula or get your insights or learn from you? Oh, yeah. My website is shebirthsbravely.com. We have a fun quiz that's um, what does your birth plan say about your personality? It kind of goes into like based on your answers, like here's some of your strengths, here's some of the things to think about, and here's what makes you an amazing mom. It's fun. If you go to shebirdsbravely.com, you can sign up for a free consultation for doula services And then within my childbirth class, every mom that comes through my childbirth class gets two prenatals where we'll do that birth plan checklist that we talked about. And then I have you go take it to your doctor. And then we come back because most of you have more questions about that 
after they do that. So, and that's just part of the birth class as well, which is also just at shebirdsbravely.com. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining me and for all your insight. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for tuning into my podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future episodes. Don't forget to share the podcast with a friend who can benefit from the valuable insights that we share here. And if you could take a moment to leave a five-star rating and review, it would mean the world to me. If you're ready to work one-on-one with me to embark on a transformational journey towards a confident and empowered hospital birth experience, go to kellyhoff.com backslash empowered and enroll in my Empowered Hospital Birth Coaching Program. Together, we'll create a roadmap to a birth experience that you'll cherish forever. That's K-E-L-L-Y-H-O-F dot com backslash empowered. Let's make your birth experience extraordinary.